Welcome back to the What's More Podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris. You are dialed in for episode 208. And in this episode, I'm going to talk about frozen houses. Yeah, weird concept of a word, but kind of you hear me talk about the lock-in effect. We all know what that means because we've talked about it so much on this show, but also the national media has done it. But I want to talk about the concept of frozen homes and what that means and, and the interesting implications behind that and what it means to our market and future markets. But first, back from a trip over the weekend, I had a great time. I had to go up to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee with the family for the third week in October. And if our listeners don't know what that means, and that is in SEC land, that is the Alabama versus Tennessee game. And I got to tell you, what an environment, what an incredible environment. For those who don't know, that's where I went to undergrad. And it was pretty impressive, not only because Tennessee won, but more impressively, just the environment and how loud it was there. I mean, hundred. imagine 102,000 people in one stadium that is just screaming at the top of their lungs. My ears are still ringing from this. It was just an incredible moment and get to share that with my wife and children and, and see that kind of game and watch everyone rush the field afterwards was pretty incredible. And uh, the Neyland effect, was definitely in full display for Neyland Stadium there in Knoxville, Tennessee. So pretty cool. Glad to be back. But uh, that was one of those surreal moments watching that happen there. And uh, uh, it was very cool to be a part of. So uh, glad to be back. But also what a whirlwind trip to go up and back and do that was pretty incredible. And this uh, Rocky Top rewind of the episode that I'll say there. So let's jump right into the uh, frozen houses. What does that mean? So this concept to me just is interesting because it represents the notion that basically current homeowners are maybe not necessarily locked into their homes, that they're more or less just frozen out of buying another home. And what I mean by that is this. So I've always said like, hey, listen, if you're going to list your home, the whole concept of this lock-in effect, if you may, is like, hey, listen, Q, I've got this home with an interest rate of like three or less, right? Maybe, hell, maybe even four or less, right? And I'm good with this payment, but I'm locked in, right? I'm locked into this payment. I'm locked into this budget. And I've always kind of projected the fact that, listen, if you're going to sell your home, it's got to be worth it, right? Like, because no one really likes to move. It's kind of a pain in the rear to move. It's stressful. I mean, there's just a lot of factors that go into it. And so the ideology of, hey, listen, I'm just going to list my home to sell it and move because I need to go get a, a bigger house or I want a bigger house or I want a newer home. I mean, all the things go with that. Like, unless there's a need, I've always said, there's no reason they're, they're, this person's not going to sell this home unless you just have a crazy offer to give that person, maybe a little bit more than what the market is yielding or maybe right at what the market's yielding, thus causing these prices to keep inching up. And that's the only reason that a seller would come off the market to want to go do that. Well, in the frozen homes concept, you're basically saying that the seller is frozen out of buying another new home due to affordability, meaning that the attraction of purchasing a property is not a necessity and it's out of the market realm of affordability. So, hey, listen, it's not the fact that you would are stressed out and you don't want to move. It's just that you're frozen out because of lack of inventory as well as lack of affordability. Now, I, again, I think you could argue it either way, but you might come to the same conclusion here by the end of this podcast that they're both on a similar path of what's going on. But in this case, I think what we, what they're trying to say is that the market's more driven towards limited inventory, right? And I did a podcast, and we're going to come back to it at the end of this episode, where I showed what the guys at MBS Highway did with the generational marketing and the generational home ownership. And that was pretty interesting to me because it yielded the fact that, you know, there's going to be a continued pressure on inventory. And because we can't backfill this with new builds, that this is going to become an issue of limited inventory for quite some time. And I think that this tends to be an issue that, okay, like, when's this cycle going to end? How do we get to the other side of this? And so in this frozen frozen house type concept here, or lock-in effect, you know, whichever one you want to call it here, we all know that for many of the households, the single biggest expense is the household expense. It's the PITI and the expenses that go along with that. Well, what's interesting on this is I'm going to pull up a chart. And by the way, this episode is going to be chart heavy. So if you're listening to this in the car, you're on Spotify, Apple, Go to the YouTube episode. Go to YouTube at What's Your One More on our channel at What's Your One More with the number one. My producer, Charlie, is going to start putting in all these graphs. The first one I'm going to bring up here is from the FRED, which is the, the Federal Reserve's division in St. Louis. And they do all the graphing and they do all the charting for the Federal Reserve. And it's a great website if you've not been to it. Uh, you can get a lot of things off here. But this is the median sales price that HUD has on here for each quarter 
dating all the way back to 2014. And when you're looking at this, you can see how back in 2014, and again, this is a national, this is national, so it could be different in your area. This is a national median price uh, of HUD data. Could be different in your area here, but a national one. I want to do that for this podcast. But if you looked at Q2 in 2014, the average price of a home was 288000 10 years later in Q2 of 2024, it's 400 and just shy of 427,000. That's almost a 48.2% increase in home over a 10 year period. And so what's interesting to me is that if you just come out of the COVID years, right, this is where a lot of the, the growth took place. If you come out of the COVID years and you say, hey, when most of the gains occurred, home prices at co- around that COVID era went up about 40% in two and a half years. Now, to me, it's like, okay, we all think we know why that happened, right? There's a lot of things going on. But I think in this particular case, that to me said, for many Americans, there was a lot of uncertainty during COVID. I know I was one of them. And that led to many Americans just looking for seeking a safer type of investment or a safe haven, if you may. And a lot of people were comfortable, particularly surrounding housing. That was another reason why you saw housing go up. The other thing was this, that the COVID money that was stimulated down drove a lot of I guess you could say excess spending or bigger factors involved in this, but the consumer goods that was driven by that, a lot of people spent money and we've documented that on that using that, that excessive stimulus money that came through and that drove the economy in a different manner, thus supplying bigger salaries, more bonuses because companies were doing well, profits were up in certain areas and stock prices in particular are what went up on that. And so you had small business owners that were doing better due to stimulus money that was being pumped in. And a lot of things naturally got inflated. And I'm not using the word inflation, inflated in the form of doing well than what they were prior to. And so what happened was you had more people upgrading their homes. I mean, you probably saw it. It was almost like a circle there. You had people buying and selling and, you know, they're upgrading, making money on home over home. And that also led to a housing conundrum that we have now of home prices going up, but it also led to the supply side of things, right? Because what I was just describing right there is the demand side, how that demand grew, how it flourished and how it got so big so fast. Well, in the background of that, a supply conundrum was happening as well, because during all of that time, we know that there was a supply shortage taking place. We know some of the labor that was out there couldn't cover all of the demand to build houses. And so we were backtracking on how many new homes were being constructed during that time, thus applying more pressure to the supply side. And that's one of the reasons why we saw this takeoff of 40% increases in home. And I believe we documented in multiple episodes why the this was the very first time where the prices of new homes were being rivaled by the prices of resales. And traditionally speaking, a newer home is going to be outpricing a resale. But during this time, they were running neck and neck because the supply was so limited on both sides of that. Another thing that was happening in the background was that we know on the rent side of things, that wasn't getting any better. Rent prices were going up exuberantly as well. I've got a chart in here. The second chart in this episode is from apartmentlist.com. This goes all the way back from 2017 forward. And right at that 2021, the significant jump that happens, again, this is a national trend, right? This is a national average, so it could be different in your market. But there's a significant jump in there in 2021 that took place up into Q1 of 2022 in the rent market. And today that stands at about the average rent, right? Stands on apartment list for $1,405 per month. You know, if you were to take that, and say, hey, listen, what does this represent of 30% of the household gross income? That's a $56,000 a year job. Now, on a household median income, that in, in America is about 80000 So shouldn't be an issue to cover that. But that's a one bedroom. What if, you're, what if you're a family? What if you have, you need an extra bedroom? All of a sudden that jumps significantly. So the rent income, for me, when you look at this, like, okay, the rent started to become a problem. Housing started to become more challenging and more expensive. All of these things were leading to the significant growth in this. And it's starting to create this frozen potential lock-in effect right in front of us. Because also what was happening is that if you looked at interest rates during the time of, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was a lot higher to finance a home during that time versus where we were during the 2020 era moving forward there. You had a numerous of people locking in that 4% or less, and that was happening. And what else was happening was that we were taking homes off of the market, thus creating less inventory because more buyers were coming to the market too because a lot of people were going, hey, listen, I want to put more money in real estate. So they weren't just buying a primary, they were buying multiple homes. And so you're seeing this market kind of absorb the inventory, if you may, that was there in the market. 
and you're starting to see more and more of these homes being taken off and locked in. Now, the notion that, hey, listen, if you look at this, you know, what was interesting is that they say 40% of current homeowners essentially say they have no mortgage at all. Now, this, I think, goes back to maybe like the K-shape recovery on here, but it's interesting because this chart on here, the third or fourth chart in this episode here, shows the growth of homeownerships that are mortgage-free in the United States. Now, I didn't really pay attention to the fact in 2010 that about 32% of all homes were mortgage-free. That had peaked in 2023 to about 40%. Now, while 8% doesn't sound like a lot, you stretch that over the amount of homeownership, it, it's significant. But 40% of homeowners have a house that's free and clear where they're really only responsible for the taxes. Yes, they're going to have insurance, but they don't have to have insurance. So you don't have to say the responsibility is there, but they're just responsible for the taxes and the upkeep of that property. Now, if you look at someone that lives in that type of you know world where everything's paid for free and clear on there, well, I mean, why would you want to sell your house unless, again, that price is significantly higher in the form of what someone's willing to offer you before you have to move and go through all that stress, go through all the packing, go through all of the motions it takes to make a move. And depending where you are in your life, maybe you're retired. Maybe that's not even the deck of cards. You just don't want to move. You could care less. You're sitting perfect where you are and you don't want to go through the stress of doing that. Now, I would imagine that of these 40% of the people that are homeowners and have a mortgage free, they're probably on the higher end of the retirement age. You know, yeah, there's gonna be some outliers in there, but I guess what I'm getting is you probably don't see many 35 year olds that have their homes paid off here, right? That's probably more on the 55 plus and up community side of things. So then that bodes the question of, do they even want to move, right? Is that part of this frozen inventory that we're talking about? And in addition to the no mortgage people, right, that large group of low mortgage homeowners that I talked about that secured those interest rates at 4% or less. Now, selling for them now, would be buying something at a much higher rate, but also at a much higher price point. And so those individuals have taken into account like, hey, listen, I know I can sell and make a ton of equity, but what am I buying that also didn't go up in extreme value? You know, oftentimes I hear people say, yeah, if I sell today, I'm just trading my equity for a higher priced home later on. And you're absolutely right. At this point, you're absolutely right. And so then pose the question is, what does it take for that person to move? You know, we talk about this all the time because what rate, what is it going to take? Was it, is it rate? Is it price? What is it? So John Burns did a survey of about 1,247 homeowners. I'm reading it here. And this graph I also have on our YouTube channel, What's Your One More? But this was basically for the New Home Trends Institute. And John Burns research consultants did this survey of 1,247 U.S. homeowners and renters. And the question was this. What interest rate is it going to take for that renter to become a homeowner and go make a purchase? And then what interest rate is it going to take for that current homeowner to go, yeah, I'll put my home up for sale and I'll go buy another home. I'll take on another mortgage. I will actually maybe become mortgage free and take on a mortgage. You know, all of this was put into this survey here. And I think the graphic kind of tells it all. About half of the survey participants said the magic mortgage rate on this particular survey is going to be 5.5. So 5.5 is what's going to move the needle and get people going. Well, I mean, we really haven't gotten down to that without points in this mortgage environment for the last 26 months. And a lot of economists, a lot of very good economists suggest that's not even in the deck of cards until we get somewhere into mid-2025. I think on this show, we've suggested 5875 would move the needle um, because I think on the mortgage side, the way our mind works is it doesn't take hardly any additional money to move it to 5.5 and a 5875 just based on applicants and just based on things that we're seeing in the market that five handle will move the needle but this is saying 5.5 right so moving with this survey here at 5.5 what bodes the question of is it really rate is it affordability is it the cost well, I'll tell you this, you add all of these things together and we have the current standoff in the market. You can now see why this frozen concept might be the reality because we haven't sniffed 5.5. We really have it. Again, you could argue you got there in points, right? You could argue you got there on a three, two, one buy down. There's all these different, you know, different examples you could have of these one offs, but you're you can't say as an industry, hey, we've hovered at five point five for longer than three seconds, right? It, you know, you just can't say that. So the rate hasn't become a target rate where you could actually say, yes, I can offer this today and I can offer it tomorrow, the next day, because it hasn't been there available like that for about twenty eight months. So all that together, what is the issue here. And it's all about buyer's affordability as well as a classic frozen market. And I will say this, I think the inventory in this frozen concept versus lock-in effect 
I think the frozen concept might have a little bit more legs to it than the lock-in effect. And the reason I say that is because this, when I go look at this, and remember this graph Barry Habib and the team at MBS Highway put together, again, I'm going to stick it back in this episode again. You're going to see it, it's called demographics and density. This graph suggests that the next 10 years home ownership rate should rise from 33 to 55%, meaning 10 more million homeowners are going to come to the market. That's suggesting a lot more apartments. It's suggesting a lot more inventory has to come to the market because we can't take another 10 million people coming to the marketplace over the next 10 years. So that's an average of 1 million extra buyers per year to the market. We don't have the inventory for that. That also bodes the question of what are these home prices going to continue to do? And I also believe that it bodes the question, is it rate or is it affordability? Well, I think the real answer is this. It isn't lower rates. I think it's more supply. And I think if we continue to get more supply that the home buyers want, more importantly, home buyers want, the market will become less frozen and more unlocked, more so than the race themselves. So we'll tune in and see what happens on that. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you like what you're hearing, please five-star review this podcast, share it with your friends, share it with your family. Don't forget, check us out. I know I mentioned it about five times on the episode at our YouTube channel at What's Your One More. Subscribe, get all the graphs, get all of our content, and check it out and share it with a friend. Thanks for tuning in to the next episode. We'll see you at What's Your One More. Got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one lot to 